Uh, welcome. So today I wanted to cover understanding and utilizing the best mesh uh, for your simulation study. So this is the finite element analysis uh, portion. So the simulation portion of the uh, portfolio. So a lot of topics that I wanted to cover. Uh, it may be a little bit um, over uh, overachieving here, but we're going to try to get through all of these. In the first one, I just wanted to explain what the mesh is then talk about different mesh types, when to use them, when not to use them, mixed mesh, mesh convergence, and then some of the common errors that you might uh, run into when trying to generate a mesh in SOLIDWORKS simulation. So let's go ahead and talk about just meshes themselves and what it means to mesh a model. So we have this continuous body. It's a cantilever beam. It's fixed on the left. We have a force on the right-hand side. And really, this is essentially a continuous problem, right? It's hard to mathematically divide it because we keep dividing it in half and half and half and half. Well, what the mesh does is it discretizes, it breaks up that continuous body and gives the software elements or chunks of that body to solve the mathematical equations over. So what you see there is it's been discretized, it's been broken up into a mesh. And from there, we get outputs like displacement, stress, and strain. So the mesh itself defines the problem for the, for the solver. It breaks it up, takes that constant problem, it breaks it down into sections. And the biggest thing to take from this is that finite element analysis, because we are defining the geometry in sections, it's a numerical approach. We're going to get very close to what real life is, but it always know that it is in a numerical approach. So let's talk about different mesh types. So there's three types that are available inside of SOLIDWORKS simulations. Uh, and before we even get there, let's talk about the geometry types that are what drives those mesh types. So the first type of geometry that we can in, uh, encounter inside of SOLIDWORKS simulation is bulky geometry. This is where your length, width, and height are very similar. So think of a brick, right? All those dimensions are in inches and they're all very, very similar. From there, we have thin geometry. So this would be sheet metal, panes of glass, um, you know, cardboard, very thin uh, cross section, but large area uh, components. So the height and the length are very similar in dimension. Let's say that they're in, you know, feet. And then the width or the thickness is in inches. So it's a quarter of an inch thick by three feet by four feet, let's say. And then lastly, there is beam geometry. So this is anything that would be created using, um, you know, weldment functionality or even just a simple extrude. So it's any geometry that has a constant cross section over a given length. So with that being said, said let's look at the different mesh elements that correspond to that type of geometry and the first type of geometry we wanted to look at is bulky geometry and that type of element is called a 3d element it's a tetrahedral element and you can see it here on the screen um, and what that does is it meshes inside that volume where the tetrahedral share edges and nodal points so the element itself is the tetrahedral. The nodes are at the corner points, and that is effectively where the equations are being solved. Now, there is draft quality, which is just corner point nodes, and then there are, <clears throat> excuse me, is high quality, and that is where you have mid-side nodes. Now, the difference between draft quality and high quality is high quality takes a little bit longer to solve, but it gives you a better understanding of how that edge is deforming because we're giving it an understanding of what's happening at that mid side. So let's go ahead and take a look at 3D geometry and how that's actually meshed. So if we look here, uh, this is a model that I use uh, quite a bit, but effectively we just have two cast arms. We have a couple of solid pins on either side and a hollow, uh, hollow structural uh, tube up here at the top. Now, this geometry is effectively bulky geometry. The length, width, and height are all very, uh, very similar. And you can see that in simulation by this icon, right? It looks like a, a block, kind of a curved block. 
and that's indicating that this is bulky geometry. So when we go to generate the mesh here, if I right click on my mesh folder and select create mesh, it's automatically saying, okay, this is going to be a tetrahedral mesh. Now there are different mesh parameters, but effectively there's standard curvature and blended curvature. We're going to talk about those later, but we're going to stick with a standard mesh. What that means is it's going to try to put the same size element across the geometry and it picked a global size for us. SOLIDWORKS is very intelligent and it understands that we should have at least one high quality element or two draft quality elements across any given thickness. So this thickness here, we would expect to see one cell if it's high quality or two cells if it's draft quality. Now, how can you tell whether it's high quality or draft quality? That's located here under the advanced option. By default, the mesh is always high quality and that's because it gives you better results. Draft quality comes into play because it's less nodal points, less places where the equations take place. And it's a very good first step if you have a very large assembly, you just wanna see is everything behaving how I would expect it to, and then switch to draft quality and have it run a little bit longer. So by default, this is high quality. So when I go ahead and mesh this, what we're going to see is it's going to put one high quality element across this given uh, thickness. And we can actually take a look at a mesh quality plot. And what this does is it shows us the uh, quality of, of this um, mesh. So if I look, I can look at aspect ratio. And what aspect ratio is, is it's the combination between the longest edge and the shortest edge. And you really want an aspect ratio really no greater than 10 for most elements. We see we have one that is uh, 15 in this model. But as long as it's not in the areas of high stress, which are actually on these arms, we're, we're okay, we're doing, we're doing just fine. So that is a solid mesh or a bulky mesh. Uh, if I look at this, let me edit the definition here again, switch it back to the mesh. I wanna show you a mesh sectioning plot. And what this allows us to do is basically take an internal look at the model. So if I turn off my section plane here, what we see is how these tetrahedral elements make up this solid geometry. So you can see how they kind of stack on top of each other. They share common edges, and then they also share common nodal points. So that's the crux or the, the um, how a solid mesh works and generates inside a SOLIDWORKS uh, simulation. The next step, type of element type corresponds to the thin geometry. And this is a shell element. So this is a element that has no thickness, but it does have a length and height. The thickness is virtual. Just like the solid mesh, the shell element has a draft quality and a high quality element type. Now, the thickness, again, is virtual, and I really want to show you that there's multiple ways of generating a shell mesh inside a SOLIDWORKS simulation. So there's three methods. There's one, the first one that I'm going to show you is the old school, what I call the old school method. The next one that I'm going to show you is the newer method. Um, it's called define shell by selective faces. And then the third method is the sheet metal method. What I have here, um, you know, I, I remember seeing these when growing up, but now everybody just has a cell phone uh, at home. But basically, this is a portable phone base is what this this uh, housing is. So the your old cordless phone would rest in this cradle and charge. But what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at a model that has a constant cross section. And what that means is that makes it a very good candidate for a shell mesh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, again, like I said, the old school method, which is I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a surface, a non, uh, a, a surface that has no thickness, and we're going to mesh that independently. So what I'm going to do is select tangency, which picks up the entire uh, outside surface of this part. I'm going to make it one millimeter because the part is two millimeters thick, and I'm also going to reverse the direction. And what that means is it's going to create a mid-plane surface on this part. 
And if I go to my bodies folder, so I have my solid body and my shell body or my surface body, I can hide my solid body. And what we are left with now is our shell or our surface body. Now, if I take a cross section through this, what we're going to see is that truly is has zero, zero thickness. Now, there's one more thing that I need to do before I go into SOLIDWORKS simulation, and that is I want to delete my solid body. Now, that's just a feature on your feature tree, so it's not going to hurt anything as far as the model standpoint, but it cleans up how the mesh is generated inside of SOLIDWORKS simulation. So because I'm starting with surface geometry, what I'm going to do is start my study. And what you're going to see is that looks a little bit different. It looks like that surface icon. And that's indicating to me that I have to define a thickness. So if I right click on that surface body in my, in my parts tree, I edit the definition of that. I'm going to specify that as a thin shell. I'm going to give it the overall thickness. And what we're going to see is if I do a full preview, we're going to see half the thickness above and half the thickness below. And that's why I made this effectively a mid a mid plane surface. You can always adjust how that offset behaves, but I found that if you do a mid plane surface when you're creating the surface body, this is the best, the best route. So when I select OK, we now have that definition. It's no longer asking me to define that. We go ahead and add my fixtures. And in this case, we are adding fixtures directly to the, the shell. We're no longer adding them to the solid body. So I went ahead and I fixed the bottom. Let's just put an arbitrary force maybe on the top here. Maybe I got really mad at a, a telemarketer and I slammed my phone down, right? Now, from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create that mesh, and it's going to look a little bit different than before. My parameters really aren't any different, but what you're going to see is the mesh itself is going to look uh, quite a bit different. So it's no longer gray. We have actually gray color on the inside, orange on the outside. And what we're actually looking for is everything that is on the outside surface, which would be the internal edge of these holes, right? Because these had an offset or a boss on them is the same as the outside color. So we can see that this one and this one, if I control select them, right click on my mesh folder and I say flip shell elements, we want the all the same color to one side or the other. And what that does is it just aligns the results appropriately. If I go ahead and run this, what you're going to see is this is going to run very quickly. And the whole point of a shell is instead of trying to put two draft quality or one high quality element across that given thickness, what this allows us to do is run it virtually and get a faster result um, and less mesh, mesh uh, problems getting a result out of the model. If I edit the definition of my um, results, we can see that we have three layers, effectively, or four layers. We have the top, we have the bottom. So this is the top surface, um, the bottom surface, the membrane, which is going to be that mid-plane surface. And then we can also look at pure bending uh, on the part as well. So we're, the results are a little bit different than the straight von Mises with a solid mesh. We're actually able to see those three layers based on the fact that this is this is a shell. And one additional option, and I don't necessarily recommend this unless uh, you have a very tight mesh, so it maps the geometry really nice, but you can also render the shell element, which actually gives it a virtual thickness. And again, I would have a pretty tight mesh to make this look a little bit, uh, a little bit better. But in general, knowing that you can look at the top and bottom and midplane surface, that's that's really where you need to be with a with a shell. So that is the old school method, right? Manually creating the surface, deleting the solid body, and then working through the problem as, as you would expect. The next way of creating a surface geometry or surface mesh or shell mesh inside of SOLIDWORKS simulation is to generate it by doing an offset um, shell faces. So I'm gonna go ahead and start a simulation study here. And what that's going to do is we see that this is actually a uh, solid geometry inside of uh, SOLIDWORKS. So if we look, we can see that if I take a section view of this, 
this is actually solid geometry, but it's very thin, right? So very similar to where we were with the um, with the foam base. Now, what I'm going to do is it's I'm not doing this inside of SolidWorks. I'm doing it inside of simulation. It's coming in as solid geometry. If I right click on that, I have defined shell by selected faces. And what that means is I can actually go in and define how I want this uh, generated. Now, the key to this is to remember which side you're generating the shell on. And then the other aspect is you need to make sure that you are picking the correct offset so that you're not growing your part by half of the thickness effectively. So I picked that lower offset that puts the shell offset towards the inside because we are selecting the outside face. When I select OK, what you're going to see is this is now defined. We have the thickness defined. We have it defined here as a surface. The next step is to put on our fixtures and our loads. Now the key to this is if we take a section view, this is still technically invisibly the solid geometry that we can put the loads in the fixtures on. So my recommendation to you is when you're applying the fixtures or you're applying the loads, assign them to whatever surfaces you defined the shell from. So in this case, it was the outside surface. If I do not do that, let's say I put a force uh, on this part and I pick this inside face. Simulation is smart, smart enough to know and say, you know, if you do this, right, so it's a side load in this case, it's no, it's not on the entity, uh, the entity is no longer on a shell. So it is intelligent enough to tell you, hey, you're, you're putting that in the wrong place, but just keep in mind, you want to put that on whatever surface you generated the shell from. And just to show you here, when I create the mesh of this and we look at the results, it is now meshing as a shell that thickness has gone away. So all the results and everything else are going to be very similar to the foam base. So that is the newer method that's defined shell by selective faces. And that's done right here in the simulation tree. And then lastly, the, the third way, uh, and in my opinion, the best way, if you can model in this fashion is model as a sheet metal component. So that's what this is inside of SOLIDWORKS simulation or inside of SOLIDWORKS, inside a simulation, the indicator is it looks like a little bent sheet metal component. Now, the beauty of this is that if I edit the definition, my thickness is locked, and that's locked to whatever gauge of sheet metal or whatever thickness we specified for the sheet metal component. The offset is correct. We don't have to worry about that. My fixtures and my uh, forces. So I put my fixture on the outside face here. If I edit the definition of this, and we remove that from the outside face and I put my force to the inside face, it doesn't matter which side you put it on, the solid model is going to transfer. And that's one of the beauties of using uh, sheet metal. So let me hide both of these guys. Let's go ahead and create a mesh. You're going to see that it meshes as a shell. And let me go ahead and run this. And what we're going to see is we're going to get those same results. We didn't have to worry about an offset surface. We didn't have to worry about doing define uh, shell by selected entities, it comes automatically through inside of uh, simulation when it's sheet metal. The other beauty of it is I didn't have to worry about which face am I applying the force to, it transfers appropriately. So if possible, even if it's just a flat surface, model it as sheet metal because it's going to behave, uh, behave a little bit uh, better. Now, the only other thing that I wanted to show you with this is when you're dealing with shells, you need to appropriately add um, contacts. So in this case, if we look at this model and I undo my body delete, I have three solid bodies, effectively what could be uh, surface bodies. Now with that, what I did was I added mid-plane surfaces and I removed uh, the solid body. If I go into the study itself, we can see that those are surfaces, right? We have a fixture down below. Let me go ahead and hide that. I have a couple forces on the top of this. But more importantly, I had to add additional bonded contacts because technically those shells or those surface bodies don't touch each other. So I had to add a bonded contact between the bottom edge of this shell and the top face of the surface. 
and then here between the two surfaces. Now the good thing about this is when I show my stress plot, what we see is we see that this part is truly bending about the, the end of the other one. So it is recognizing that that, that that thickness is there and we're getting that stress kind of developing where it's bending. Same thing with this, that bonded contact carried over and it is bending over. It's not just flopping over as though there was no contact there. So if you're manually defining the, the shells, either by the uh, old school method or by the defined shell by selected entities, and they are offset like this, right? You need to add those manual bonded contacts into play. Now, just to show you very similar model, but a very similar model made out of sheet metal. Now, these are touching, they're sheet metal, so it's very similar to the last one, but I'm not creating any um, surface bodies. And if we go in and we look at this, I don't have to add any additional contacts. I'm just using the global bonded contact. And if I mesh and run this, what we're going to see is we're going to see those results. Let me hide my forces. Let me hide my fixtures. And what we can see is this one is bending up around that corner. This one is bending over as though it's bonded. And again, if you can do it as sheet metal, that would be my recommendation. Sheet metal works really well with shells from picking up those automatic contacts, as well as just defining where you want your forces uh, to be located. So let's go ahead and look at the third element type. And that third element type has to do with the beam uh, geometry. So a constant cross section over a given, thick, or a given length. And that is a beam element. What that does is it puts nodes along the neutral axis of the beam. And really it is a point uh, mesh. So it's very hard to see on the screen. So it is represented by default as a cylinder or as a, effectively a tube. So to do a beam mesh, uh, what you see here is you see a weldment. Now it can be any uh, component it doesn't have to be generated as a weldment, but the nice thing with this is if it is generated as a weldment, it automatically comes in as a beam, uh, a beam mesh. Now, a couple things that are different about a beam mesh versus a shell or a solid mesh. Uh, one is it looks like an I beam in here. The other aspect is you have something that is called the joint group, and joints are where entities are held together. So if we look at this lower section here, let me. Uh, zoom in. We have a neutral axis mesh, right? So it's, it's a, a basically a line that goes down the neutral axis of this beam, down the neutral axis of this beam, and where that those two connect, that's called a joint, and that's what holds those together. If they are pink, uh, it's the intersection of two beams. If they are gold, it is the end of a beam that is not connected to anything, uh, anything else. Now, with that, we can add fixtures to this um, and to fix the geometry, you are basically picking those end joints or a joint. Um, and you can tell that by the indicator here. Assigning a load. So let's say I wanna assign a force to this. I can assign it to a joint itself and pick a reference here. So let's maybe, maybe make this a side load and maybe put uh, 20 pounds on that. Uh, so that's pointing in at that joint. And let's also add another load. The other way of doing it is coming in and specifying that it's on the entire beam. And in this case, I want this to be in a downward um, fashion. And let's put uh, 150 pounds on that one. So you can assign your loads to either a joint or an entire beam. You can assign your fixtures to the joints themselves. When I generate the mesh for this, we're not really asked uh, about any uh, quality, right? So before we could vary this, the cell size. Now what you see is it, it's uh, fixed. It's gonna generate per the length of the beam. Now you can add mesh control uh, in, in areas uh, with regards to this. And so you can refine some things, but in general, it does a good job of kind of depicting these. Let me hide the joint group here as well, kind of clean that up. Now you're looking at it and you're probably thinking the exact same thing I did when I first saw it. These were square tubes, not round tubes. Again, this is just the representation of what that mesh looks like. If we wanted to, we could right click on that and say render beam profile. That's gonna give us a better understanding of what those beams look like. 
that's going to be easier to show your boss and say, look, this is what, these are the results that I got. When I run this, the only difference here, uh, actually, let me define the material, is with these results, uh, they're going to be very specific to beams themselves. So you're going to get axial and bending stress uh, on the beams and, the dis and then displacement. So if we look here, it is upper uh, upper bound axial and bending. I can look at just axial. I can look at uh, bending in direction one and direction two. I can also look at shear. And one of the really uh, cool items that you can get with this is you can actually get out your beam uh, plots. So if I pick my beam diagram, let's say I want to look at it on this beam. I can go in and say, you know what, I want to see shear in direction two. So these are those plots that we had to create by hand uh, back in school. But as far as generating that beam mesh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It does a lot of the a lot of the legwork for you. You're going to get an icon that looks like an I beam. The biggest thing is understanding what those joints mean and then assigning your loads and your fixtures appropriately to those beam to those beam elements. So that's all well and good when you're dealing with all bulky geometry, right? That leads to a uh, solid mesh, dealing with all thin geometry that leads to a shell mesh. Then you're dealing with all maybe weldment or structural components. Those lead to a beam mesh. But what happens when you need to mix those together? And that's exactly what I wanted to talk about next, which is a mixed mesh environment. So when you're talking about a mixed mesh, there's some considerations that you have to take into, uh, into account. Interference. Number one, contacts and how those contacts behave, loads, and then fixtures. So let's go ahead and look at a mixed mesh example. Long one. So with this example, we actually have all three types uh, of elements in this component. So if we look, uh, down here, these feet are, are solid elements, um, so that would be considered bulky geometry. Clearly, we have the uh, frame, right, the underlying frame, so those are all structural members. That's going to be a weldment. And then we also have the uh, sheet metal component here as well, and that is going to be our shell element. Now, if we did that sheet metal component as a mid-surface, we would have to add a lot more uh, contacts in here to make that work. However, because I use sheet metal, it automatically carries over. So if we go and we look at this from just a static load uh, standpoint, we can see that there is a joint group that was calculated, and that is specific to uh, the weldment profiles. From there, I did add some contact sets, and mainly the contact set that I utilized was between the end joint of this leg in the face of that foot pad. And again, that is going to be solved as a solid. Now you're going to ask, does that transfer the profile of the beam to the surface of the, of the uh, solid foot? Or does that just act as a point load? The answer is it transfers the profile of that, of that beam, which is actually really uh, interesting, actually really good. Because from that standpoint, you're going to get more of a true stress output uh, from that as well as deflection. And then lastly, um, I did add this in just to show you it wasn't necessary uh, from a standpoint of, of this being sheet metal, but I added it uh, just to kind of explain a result here. So up here, I have the beam, the entire beam selected. And then I have the inside surface of the sheet metal component. And the reason that I bring this up is if I look at this uh, from a side view, when adding a bond of contact, and especially if you do it as defined by selected faces, uh, as how you create your shell, or you do it as a mid-surface creation of the shell, if you do not choose the entire beam and you just choose the joints to this point and this point, and we put a downward or a, a normal load to that sheet metal, if it's just the joints defined, it would actually uh, completely ignore those beams and only look at the joints. So we would actually bend that sheet metal through the beams. The better way of adding that contact is to choose the entire beam. 
and then choose the face of the sheet metal or the surface uh, geometry. So I just wanted to point that out. I've got roller sliders of, uh, attached to the bottom uh, surfaces, and I have a fixed hinge on all the bolt, all the bolt hole locations. I have a 500 pound force. Let me show you that. Um, that is pushing down uh, normal to gravity on that face. And if we take a look at the mesh, we're going to see that this is truly a uh, mixed mesh environment. So we have a solid mesh here on the feet. You can see that it's clearly a beam mesh from the cylindrical profile. And then we have a shell mesh on the uh, sheet metal geometry. And from that, these are the results that we get. So if we look at stress, and because it's a mixed mesh environment, we can look at the shells and solids together, right? So we can look at von Mises stress here. We can actually see this bowing in between those beams, right? So that contact did behave appropriately, and we are kind of getting that scalloped uh, effect from that. Now, this is a very high deformation scale, uh, just to show you. But if I edit the definition of the stress plot and I switch this then to beams, we can see the stress generated because of the beams. Now that's axial. We can look at maybe upper bending in direction one, upper bending in direction two. Or if we go back to solids, uh, solid and shells, we can look at von Mises or any of the other uh, 3D outputs. Now that's really the only difference in dealing with a mixed mesh. Displacement is going is displacement whether it's a beam profile or a solid or a shell, so you're going to get that uh, that output uh, with regards to the entire the entire model. And just like before, like I said, we can do the um, render profile. So if I edit the definition here, and we do render beams and shells in 3D, uh, it is a little bit slower. But you know, when you provide this to your boss, it looks like the geometry that you would uh, be be presenting him with. He's not going to ask. Why did you make it out of uh, round round two? So that's a mixed mesh uh, environment. And again, the key to that guy is really the contacts, understanding those, and then you know appropriately assigning the lows, whether it's to a beam, to a joint, or to a face or a, a surface. So mixed meshes are typically the most efficient, right? Appropriately using the different mesh types leads to efficiency in, in run times. And always consider the contacts, the connectors, and any interference that may occur in the model. That one actually didn't have any, but if there was, um, you would have to take that into account. So let's talk a little bit, let's switch gears and talk about mesh convergence. Now, this is going to be mesh convergence on a solid piece of geometry, but what mesh convergence does is it says it gives you a feel for the validity of your results. You want to make sure that those results kind of make sense. You have plateaued out to a given uh, number with, with your results. And by doing that, what we're going to do is make the mesh smaller in order to make sure that we are kind of uh, settling down on a given stress, high stress number. This can be tracked kind of three different ways. One is doing it manually. That's what we're gonna do first. We can use the trend tracker, which is part of simulation uh, standard and above. And then we're also going to look at an adaptive mesh uh, control option. So let me go ahead and close this file. So what we he see here is this uh, end link for a uh, suspension component. And if we look at the model, it has a force of 500 pounds assigned to this. So it's pulling outward on it uh, in the X direction. It is fixed on this inside circle of the other end. So we're going to be putting this in tension. And if we look at the mesh itself, this is a standard mesh, I believe. Let me edit the definition of that. Or actually, let me go to details. Uh, so the mesh details will show us. So it's a standard mesh, a element size of 4.9, so roughly 5 millimeters. And if we look, we have a stress value of, you know, 11,993 PSI uh, for this for this component. Uh, and we see a displacement value there as well. So the stress is really what we want to converge on.
the order that the solver solves for these outputs is displacement first, then back calculate strain, then back, cal back calculate stress. So stress is going to be the one with the most air, so that's always the one that you're going to want to converge, converge on. So that's the initial mesh. So it's, it's trying to put that same mesh everywhere. And note, we're right around 12,000 uh, PSI. From there, you would add in mesh control. Now, mesh control can be found by right-clicking on the mesh and saying apply mesh control. And where you want to apply that is at areas of high stress. So we had a high stress in these two internal radiuses. That's where I'm going to assign it. And what you see is it's cutting the global element size in half automatically. Now we can adjust that number as well. Now, if I look at the mesh, so if we show this, what you're going to see is you can see that the mesh is tighter in this area. By giving it more elements, we're giving it more definition, a better understanding of how the displacement takes place, therefore giving a better uh, understanding of how the stress uh, results. So if I look at my stress plot for this, you know, we went from 11,999 uh, or 800, I believe, uh, to 12,164. So we can see that that value is kind of trending up. But what we want to do is we want to get that so it kind of plateaus out. And if we look here again, I added additional refinement into the model. So if I show the mesh, what you're going to see is not only did I take the element size down in these areas, but I also took it up into this upper radius uh, fillet here as well. And if we look at the stress of this now, we're 12,631 uh, with regards to this. So usually it takes four or five stress increments, but we're going to start to plateau out right around 12,600, 12,700. So that's the first method is adding tighter mesh control into the model and watching that upper stress level and watching that kind of plateau uh, plateau out. The other way of doing it is by use of a trend tracker. So the trend tracker is just an inbuilt mechanism that allows us to set a baseline for a study and then understand how things have changed. Now this is uh, very dependent upon sensors and sensors are added up here at the top. So I have one for mass, I have one for stress, and I have one for displacement. And these sensors are simply just right clicking on the sensors folder and saying add sensor, or you can come up to the top in the command prompt and just type in sensor. It's going to take you in there as well. Uh, so the sensors are related to simulation data, and the trend tracker is going to leverage those to understand what's happening in the model. So for this one, you can see that there is a mesh control, but I have that hidden uh, at this point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run this study. So we have valid results. So what we should see is we're right around 12,025 on this one. So uh, just about where we were originally. I'm going to add a trend tracker. So it's just a right click on top of the study and then trend tracker. And from there, it adds that trend tracker study uh, or, or tab in the study tree. From there, I'm going to right click and say set baseline. And what it's going to do is it's going to use this as our first data point. So what it's looking at is it's looking at the mass because I have that mass sensor. It's looking at stress and displacement because I have those uh, sensors as well. I'm going to go ahead and add in another uh, mesh control to this. So we'll go ahead and say apply mesh control. And again, I'm just going to pick, you know, maybe these inside uh, surfaces on that radius where the high stress was. And again, I'm going to just use the default uh, half value. Let me go ahead and run this again. So it's going to mesh it and run it. And what you're going to see is it's automatically going to add another um, trend point. So if I don't, if I say don't show again, and then yes, it'll add that automatically. But it takes those values. And what we're going to see here, and again, stress was an important one, we see from data point one to data point two that that stress did, uh, did indeed go up. We're right around 12,291 now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and unsuppress my additional mesh control, and I'm going to suppress my first one here. So we have this one. Let me go ahead and generate the mesh. So not only is this generating a tight uh, mesh in the areas of high stress, but I also picked some of these inside edges as well, because I noticed that those had uh, a stress value on those. 
Let me go ahead and run this one. And what we should see now is we should see a kind of trend for the for that stress where it's going to start to kind of uh, level level out a little bit. So we're right around twelve thousand eight hundred ninety nine. I look at my stress value here so we can see this kind of still uh, moving up if i look at my mass that stayed constant and my displacement is fairly fairly constant and if i wanted to i could go into my uh my mesh control again maybe drop this from 1.5 to maybe 0.75 we're gonna mesh this even tighter let me go ahead and run this again and we'll see you know kind of if that if that leveled out but this is a, it's using the manual process, but it's not creating new studies for that. It's actually just rerunning that same study and using the trend tracker to keep this, uh, keep this in mind. So we're right around 12,507. So if I go back into my stress, right, we're going kind of up and then back down. In reality, we're probably right around here for a conversion result. It probably would take two more runs to kind of get that to flatten, flatten back out in two more runs with a, a tighter mesh on those. Now, the third method is the adaptive mesh control. And let me go ahead and run this. Uh, this is again with the default mesh. So we'll take a look at this. And what you're gonna end up with, and I just wanna show you that we're starting from that same uh, stress value. What you're gonna end up with is turning on the adaptive meshing in the study properties. Now, uh, right around 12,117, if I right click here and I go to the properties of the study, this is where the adaptive mesh uh, resides. Now, this is only valid for solid meshes, so just keep that in mind. But we have an H adaptive and we have a P adaptive uh, method. So the P adaptive is if you go back to that tetrahedral element with that mid side node, that high quality element. That is a second order, basically a quadratic equation that defines that edge and how that edge moves. P adaptive stands for polynomial. What you do is you increase the polynomial order, basically adding more nodes along the edges of the elements, but keeping the elements the exact same size. This was a very valid method up through mid the mid nineties when uh, computer machines uh, computers started running a lot more efficiently having better RAM, better speed time, uh, processor speeds, H adaptive kind of took over and H adaptive is, is effectively what we just did, which is going in and manual, uh, allowing the computer to adjust the mesh sizing appropriately. And what we see here is we have a target accuracy of 98%. I usually say, do not touch this, don't move it. 98% uh, is a pretty good accuracy. And then there's an accuracy bias. So local faster means it's only going to refine the mesh in the areas of the highest stress. Global or slower means it's going to refine the mesh pretty much everywhere. So right in the middle is usually a good uh, a good mix of that. So I usually say don't uh, don't uh, touch that. But we're going to go ahead and say we want to do a maximum uh, number of of loops of five. Now if it doesn't find convergence in those first five, just run it again. Now. All I have to do is have that turned on and run the analysis. I have that finished. It does take a little bit of time because it does iterate through multiple meshes. So I have that adaptive finish and let's look at the results of that. First, let's look at what mesh uh, it, it generated. And you can see not only did it refine the mesh in these areas, but it refined it in these pockets as well. So notice that there was a, a decent amount of stress in there. Let's go ahead and look at the overall or the um, stress that it kind of plateaued out at. We're right around 12,915. So again, you know, we're, we're right around that 13,000 number. Our engineers were conservative. We probably would round up to 13,000 and call it, call it a day with regards to that. But those are the three methods, the manual method of adding mesh control and just running the study, right? Uh, the trend tracker method of adding mesh, me, uh, mesh control, but using the trend tracker to follow those, follow those results with a trend graph, and then the adaptive method, which is turned on by going into the study properties and turning on either H adaptive or P adaptive meshing. So the adaptive mesh control is kind of automatic. Again, that only works on a solid mesh. 
the manual methods that I showed you work on a shell and solid uh, solid mesh, but you want to add mesh control to those high those high stress areas. What I wanted to cover now is standard versus curvature versus blended curvature and kind of the differences between those. So what I have here is I have a cast cover and I wanted to kind of talk about the differences and I want to uh, make note of the different mesh parameters that we're going to use, what the node count is for each one of those, because that's the number of equations um, where the number of equations are effectively being solved. And then the stress results that came from those. So let me go ahead and jump into the uh, model here and we'll just talk about how this is set up and we'll run or we'll take a look at the standard uh, mesh result. So we have this, this cast cover uh, and if I go in and I look at my first run here, which is just using the default standard mesh, the setup is fairly straightforward. So I have uh, fixed hinges on all of the bolt holes. That's to mimic the fact that they can't move along the axis, but they can rotate like a bolt would, would allow. And then I have a virtual wall on this bottom surface. And what that means is I have an internal pressure on this. It's going to allow this to kind of pull off of that virtual wall, just like if it was you know mounted to another surface, but it can't push through that virtual wall. And then I have an internal pressure on this of 500 PSI on the inside, uh, inside surfaces. Now, if we look at the mesh and I look at my details of the mesh, it, the meshing parameter was a standard mesh. It is uh, high quality. And if we look, apologize about that, the total number of nodes on this is 3, uh, 37,815. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the mesh and I get a feel for it here. And again, this tried to put the same size cell everywhere in the model. And if we look at the stress output, we're right around 42,000 PSI. So for a standard mesh, that's the mesh parameter that was used, right? Uh, we ended up with 37,000 nodes and 42 KSI as far as our stress output. Now, my recommendation is usually to then add refinement to the standard mesh. And that's exactly what happened here. So anywhere uh, that the stress was kind of high, I went in and added mesh control. And this is a uh, mesh control that cut that element size down uh, a decent amount. Let's go ahead and look at the mesh now with the standard measure and the mesh control. If we look at the stress output, we're right around 48,000 for this. So the standard uh, mesh with mesh control brought us up to 139,000 nodes and right around 53,000 uh, KSI. The next option is to do a curvature based mesh. Now with that, what that means is if I go into my create mesh, so far, we've been using the mesh parameter, which is this guy right here, that is standard. What that does is it tries to put the same mesh everywhere, and then we add mesh control to that to refine the mesh in areas of interest. Curvature-based mesh kind of does that automatically, and it does it on cast parts like this, parts that have a lot of fillets. What this does is it uses a global size. This is the, actually the exact same global size I used in the other um, runs but then it automatically refines the mesh in areas of curvature. So if I show the mesh now, not only are those areas that I added mesh control uh, refined, but all the areas that have curvature in the model are automatically refined. Now you're gonna say, well, why is that bad? Uh, it's not bad necessarily, but what it does, remember we went from 139,000 uh, nodes, we're now up to 214,000. So if this was a very large model or a model that had a lot of cast parts or a lot of uh, filleted areas, you can make your mesh quite large unintentionally just by using the curvature uh, based meshing. If we look at the stress output, we're right around 53. So that actually got us very close to where we were uh, with using the standard mesh with a little bit of mesh control, but we were able to do that right off, right from the beginning, uh, 
uh, using the curvature base mesh. Now, again, the efficiency isn't as good because we're talking about 214,000 nodes. The next option is the blended curvature. Now, blended curvature is that third meshing parameter type. And if we go in here to create the mesh again, that is this guy down here. Now, again, I use the same global size. What I will tell you is I use blended curvature only when necessary. Typically, what I do if I can't get a part to mesh or I'm, I'm trying to kind of refine it, start off with a standard mesh, use mesh control, then switch to curvature if need be. Blended curvature is only used if there are problems in the model that you may have uh, you know, issues with. So we're at 0.48, and from there, let's go ahead and take a look at this mesh. So what we see is it actually came out pretty nice. It looks a little bit more uniform than the curvature-based mesh. What I will tell you is you're always going to receive a high aspect ratio warning uh, with, regards to, with regards to a blended curvature mesh. It does take longer to generate blended curvature mesh only uses one core to solve, where the other meshing parameters use multiple cores. If we look at the details of this mesh, we can see that we're at 103,000 nodes. So it is, it is less, it's kind of a, a middle line there. And if we look at the stress output, we're right around 55,944. So it is giving us a little bit higher stress, more than likely that's because of the higher aspect ratio cells. But where we ended up at there is about 103,000 nodes, 53, uh, sorry, 53.9 as far as the uh, stress in KSI. Now, those are the different methods. Um, the other method would be just to go crazy and do a global refined mesh. And this is the one that I never recommend doing, but a lot of our customers do. So what that is, is going into the create mesh and touching the slider at the top which i always recommend never touching because what that does is it makes the mesh very fine very quickly and very large so let me go ahead and show this so this is like adding mesh control but it's adding mesh control across the entire mesh if we look at the details of this one we're right around 597,000 nodes so this is going to run a lot slower. However, we're getting stress in those same uh, same locations, and we see we're right about 54,000 uh, psi. So the global refined mesh, right, 597,000. We're at 54,000 ksi. So out of those last four that are kind of working towards a convergence, my recommendation is always to do a standard mesh with mesh control. If you can, if you're not having any problems meshing, and what that does is it's going to give you a good feel for uh, the model, the outputs, but keep it very efficient. So that's the difference between um, the blended curvature versus standard versus curvature. Let's talk really quick about common errors that you might uh, want to look for, and then also uh, the hybrid mesh. So some common errors in the mesh are Interference, um, compatible versus incompatible, utilizing mesh control in different areas, and then uh, meshing individual parts. So let's look at this here real quickly. Um, the first model is a model that I is same as the first model we looked at. However, if we go in and we try to mesh this, let's say create mesh. We're just going to use the default settings. We're going to get a warning. And this is one that comes up quite a bit for me. Um, and it's, you know, you have two bodies interfering. Do you want to check interference? If you say yes, it's going to give us an interference uh, check. And it also gives us that warning that, hey, you've got problems here. So any interference in the model is going to cause the mesh to try to overlap, right? So you have nodal points on one part to another that are not coinciding, they're overlapping. So my recommendation is always to go in and manually remove that interference. So in this case, I have a configuration that removed that, you know, like we saw before when I go ahead and go to create this, 
it's going to create just fine because there's no interference in the model. So if you have mesh failures, if it warns you about uh, interference, that is something that is going to need to be removed and, and taken care of. Another uh, problem that you, you may run into is this guy right here. So this is a training example, but it's a, a pretty good one. If I look at generating a mesh on this, so let me go ahead and create a mesh. It's gonna be a standard mesh. What we're going to run into is it's not gonna be able to mesh all of the components. So we see that one of those failed or two of them failed. So the arm and then uh, screw dash one. So we can go into mesh failure diagnostics. What that does is it opens up this window over here to the left. And it gives you some options. One is to maybe mesh those as incompatible, show bodies which failed to mesh, right, which was those two. Um, we can add mesh control right from here, and we can also check the geometry, make sure there isn't a problem with the geometry. One of the things that I usually recommend doing is opening up one of the components by itself that failed to mesh, which is this guy right here. Start a static study on it, and look at what the software recommends as far as the size of mesh because it is looking at that geometry and then mesh it using a standard measure and see if it meshes in this case it did right we didn't have any problems so the part by itself isn't having any any issues it is how it interacts with the other geometry in the model so one of the things that you can do is you can go in and you can say okay i'm going to add mesh control but i'm going to add mesh control to that entire body and by doing that, if we look at the mesh now, what you're going to see is that part meshed. It was able to mesh appropriately, and it meshed within the rest of the model. We still have that back uh, screw that is having a problem. So that's one way of doing it is open up each individual part, create a mesh just on those study, and then a mesh on just those, and then use those settings. This, is, this mesh control is the same setting as what was it used in the individual study and it generally will solve that problem another option of doing it notice uh, i do have mesh control here but is to turn on compatibility versus incompatibility now compatibility is located under the global contact and what that means is a compatible mesh tries to align the mesh from one part to another by making it incompatible the software is going to mesh each part individually so where nodes would normally be shared, you're actually gonna have two layers there. And by doing this, and what we're gonna see here is I'm gonna go ahead and create that mesh that's incompatible. It's going to mesh all the components. So where this couldn't really resolve a mesh between this lower or this upper handle component and the set screw, it was able to, in this case, because we told it to mesh each one of these individually, the nodes no longer completely align between one or another component. And that's perfectly fine because we have algorithms behind the scenes that transfer the loads appropriately. So that's another way of kind of getting around those, those warnings. The other option um, is to go in. Now, again, I have that same mesh control on the uh, handle, but is to actually go in and generate a uh, mesh using a curvature based mesh so let me go ahead and create the mesh here we're going to see that this is curvature and we're going to go ahead and let this solve through and as this solves what you're going to see is it was able to mesh and make those match i did not have uh, this is still compatible i didn't do anything with the compatibility all that i did was i tried a curvature based mesh so when you run into meshing problems one of the things that you can do with regards to that is check for interference. That's the first thing I always do. Second thing is to utilize mesh control and try meshing just the failed part or switch the compatibility or switch the mesh parameter, right? Versus standard versus curvature. And generally what I found is that steps three and four can be switched. So those are the uh, ways of going through those common, those common errors and common iterations and understanding how to fix you know, some of those meshing problems that you might run into. So lastly, what I wanted to cover is just the 2020 hybrid mesh. And uh, I've been doing the bulk of this in 2019, and I did that on purpose 
um, because I didn't want to give away what the 2020 output looks like. So let me open up 2020 here and we'll talk about the hybrid mesh. So the hybrid mesh can only be used in an assembly. It's made, it's made to reduce the degrees of freedom, the number of equations that are being solved. It is color coded, orange is draft quality, blue is high quality. And you can also see down here at the bottom, you've got this wavy element. That means it's high quality, draft quality has the straight edge. So let me go into 2020 here and just show you how you can access that. So as soon as this loads up, let's get uh, simulation added in. If I come down here to my study, what you're going to see is if I look at the mesh, all of these components are high quality. You can see that by that, that triangle. Now, what I wanna do is let's show the mesh here. And you can tell that it's a blue color, right? So that's indicating that everything is high quality. But you know, if we look at the stress result for this, right, these pins really do not see any stress. So there's no need to mesh those as high quality, right? It's just giving us more data than we really need. It's causing it to run longer than necessary. So by right-clicking on those components, you can say apply draft quality mesh to all, and that's all that are selected. So you can see here, these are still wavy. These two are solid. I'm gonna go ahead and remesh this. I'm gonna go ahead and create the mesh. And what you're going to see is it meshes these pins as a draft quality. The rest of the components is high quality. And if I run this, you're not gonna notice anything except for it may run a little bit faster. This is a pretty quick model on its own, but my result is, is the same because I'm still have high quality in the areas of high stress. I have draft quality in the areas of low stress. So that's a new option. It's one additional way of making your mesh very efficient. Um, so I highly recommend doing that in 2020. It does use the incompatible uh, capabilities, but it's only incompatible in these contact regions. So it's a, a nice new feature for 2020. Let me uh, wrap this up with some of those conclusions. Um, so mesh generation can be complex or it can be very simple. It's really up to how you want to move through it. Optimizing a mesh, um, really utilizing the standard mesh with mesh control is my preferred method but using curvature base can also provide a pretty good mesh. So you can see here, this is with mesh control. On the right-hand side, on the left side is with curvature base. So you can play with those options and really see what works best for you. Also, you know, use a mixed mesh. Use those areas where you have you know, thin sections. Do not mesh that as a solid, mesh it as a shell. Uh, convergence, in my opinion, is a must. You should converge your model. So that doesn't mean for every you know, every possible design possibility. So you're early in the design process, just do a, a comparative basic mesh. When you've settled on two different designs to try to move forward with maybe prototype, then find convergence on those models. Make sure that you have that. Then you have a very good understanding of what that stress is going to be. And then the contacts and connections. Anytime you're in an assembly environment or a multi-body environment, you're dealing with different mesh components, whether they're uh, you know mixed mesh or they're all solid or all shell. Contacts and connections are a very important important aspect. So you know one one thing that I usually kind of uh, let people know: simulation is not hard. It's just knowing where the options are. So always tackle your solid simulation mesh head on. You know, go in, try it different ways. If it fails, it fails. Don't worry about it, try a different way. And remember, we are here to help. That's why uh, CATI exists. That's why we're here for you. We've got six simulation specialists. You know, when you call in with a question, we're going to be there to help uh, help answer those.